And in my opinion, the only way that women are going to get equal rights is by uh, really being active about it. Women have too long simply sat back and waited for something to happen. Well, things don't happen by waiting for it. Uh, you know, President Kennedy never would have found me uh, down here in Texas if I hadn't told him that I was here. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you know, women, I think, stand just about where the Negro did 40 years ago. <laughs> as far as public stuff, um, office is concerned. Gene, would you rather have 28 rebounds or 29 points? I'd rather really have 28 rebounds. So that's, that's my main. <laughs> that's what I really like to do, rebound. You had 13 points, too, last 13 night. 13 points, uh-huh. But I'd rather really have the rebounds. Is Simpson any good on rebounding? Oh, he's real good on the rebound. Just because when they close me out underneath, he's there. Simpson, let me ask you, would you rather have 29 points or 28 rebounds? Well, tell us about it out, both of them. <laughs> How many but rebounds did you get last night? I got nine last night, and uh, I was a little disappointed in myself. I should have got more than nine, but uh, he was doing most of the rebounding anyway, and I was doing just fast breaking. You know, he was the main reason that we, you know, just because he was rebounding, we just fast break on him and everything. They just couldn't stop us, and they wasn't getting back. And they was all over before they knew it. You know, they was out the game. How <laughs> high? Uh, <laughs> how high can you go, Eugene, when you have to? Oh. I don't know really, but one day when you know when season started, uh, that was, it was in about September, and I went up to 13-1. I was out of shape and all that. And Simpson went to 13-2, and so um, really, I believe I could get a little higher than he can. <laughs> you gonna dispute that, Simpson? <laughs> I don't know. He can jump, and I think I can jump too. So I don't know. Well, let's get uh, let's look down the line now. You got some tough away uh, from home games coming up, don't you? After yeah. the Rice game, of course. Oh yeah, we play Baylor and SMU. And uh, well, I think you know the biggest problem with us is we just go and play as a team and uh, don't have make that many mistakes like turnovers and everything. I think that uh, we could uh, you know win. That's the way I feel about it because I think if we just you know shoot if we are because I don't think nobody can really you know stop us on the board because. Uh, well, SMU, they don't have no really no, no big men, and you know. I don't think they can stop Goo on the boards or me either. And Baylor, well, they got Chapman, you know, but I don't think they can stop both of us, you know. I think that's a big factor of the game, you know, rebound. I think it's a bigger factor than scoring myself because you get the rebound, it's just lack of score, like 20 rebounds. That's, I would say that's 56 points, you know, or something like that. That's well, what I feel about it. If they miss a goal and you get the rebound, it's almost like a turnover, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it's really just like a turnover. Where did you get the nickname of Goo? Oh, really? I got that name when I was about one year old. And that's, that's all I know about it, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that the jury is completely unqualified to sentence, and that by all means, the uh, um, judge should be the uh, sentencing. After having had a report from the probation officer, after consulting with the probation officer, uh, they are much better qualified than uh, a jury is to uh, sentence. Uh, this, the new uh, penal code does uh, repeal the uh, statute with reference to capital punishment. I'm certainly in favor of that. Capital punishment does not deter. It's uh, just a matter of uh, retribution. And uh, uh, I myself would never feel that I was wise enough to inflict the death penalty on somebody and say that that person should not live any longer. The president's span of control has become wider and wider. It's been necessary to greatly increase the executive staff in order to handle the decision making that this involves. Uh, anyone who studied management uh, realizes that uh, if you're going to be efficient, you must reduce the span of control so that the 
top executives can spend more time with those who are in charge of the various programs, and that's the intent. And so as a citizen of... What the Black Brothers that talked earlier were trying to tell you is that there's a need for revolution and that fascism is a reality here in this country and that you don't have freedom of speech and you don't have freedom of the press. But what the pigs are proving to you is that that's true. In other words, they were just talking about it before. It's obvious that it's true now because they're coming onto your campus, a public campus, and telling you, you the public can't hear public speakers. But I'm sure that I haven't seen this type of demonstration last year when the Viet Cong destroyed a village, killed women and children. Perhaps the best way of all to analyze what's happening here at North Texas State is to remember the way it used to be covering meetings like this as a newsman. At first, the meeting was the important thing. Then, as the time went by, the months and the meetings and the rallies, it came to pass that most of the students joked with us wanting their pictures taken. Today, here in Denton, we find the students don't want us here, which just might indicate they'd as soon not have the rally going on on their campus. Jerry Taft, Channel 8 News on the Move at North Texas State.
The dissident college students one hears from so often these days are usually advocating radical change in the system. They want to part with hidebound tradition to get away from what they call establishment values. For years, it's been traditional for graduating UTA students to march across the stage at commencement and receive their diplomas individually. But this year, a faculty committee headed by history professor C.D. Richards decided that only masters and Ph.D. graduates, in addition to honor students, should be individually recognized. The rest would stand as a group to be conferred with degrees. And so, instead of having two graduations a year, now we only have one, and we have so many graduates, it became practically mechanically impossible. The student newspaper at UTA, The Shorthorn, and its editor, Don Sloan, advocate retaining the ceremony as it is. Their decision to only let uh, honor graduates and graduate students walk across the stage at commencement is uh, highly unfair to most of the people graduating. I feel that graduation is an honor in itself, and that they shouldn't set these people up on a pedestal like that. I don't feel that, uh, while, while they deserve it, I don't feel they deserve it any more than some of the people who, who will be sitting in the audience who perhaps have worked uh, as hard or even harder than uh, some of those graduating with honors. One alternative that's been proposed is to hold separate commencements for each school in the university prior to the large final gathering here in Texas Hall. That would allow the shortening of the prime ceremony as well as the recognition of the individual student. A meeting was held today to discuss that alternative. We'll know the results soon. Jay Lewis, Channel 8 News on the Move at the University of Texas at Arlington. It has, been recently, it has recently been revealed by the American press that dead U.S. soldiers have been found in Laos wearing South Vietnamese uniforms. According to U.S. figures, the bombings of Laos is the most extensive bombing in the history of warfare. And since 1969, 30,000 people... Governor Preston Smith's second tax and budget proposal to a joint session of the legislature included several major tax increases. However, he began his speech expressing disappointment that the legislature had not accepted his no-tax proposals originally made right after inauguration. First, I recommend that the rate of the general sales tax be raised to 4%, effective July the 1st, 1971. This will raise an anticipated $300 million. It is my belief, and I think that you will agree, that increasing the rate of the sales tax is a much more acceptable solution than removing exemptions. My second recommendation is that the tax rate on the sale of motor vehicles be increased from 3% to 4%. This will raise an additional $70 million during the biennium. My third and final recommendation is that tuition for non-resident students in our state-supported colleges and universities be raised from $200 to $500 per semester, and that the tuition for Texas resident students be increased from $50 per semester to $125 per semester. Governor Smith said that, in fact, his total tax recommendations would raise $50 million more than his budget would require. This, he said, is needed because it's time to start building up a little reserve. That's considerably changed from his original plan, which would have required deficit financing in future budgets. Also, Governor Smith made it plain that he will not accept a one-year budget. He repeated that he vetoed a one-year budget in 1969 with a definite indication that he would do so again if one is passed by the legislature this time. 
Reaction to Governor Smith's budget proposals and tax measures was generally mixed throughout the legislature. He only recommended uh, a 10-month welfare spending proposal. This is going to necessitate a special session. If we're going to write welfare spending for 10 months, we should go ahead and write it for 12 months. As I have said, uh, in regard to all other state spending, uh, a, a one-year bill would be more realistic. Uh, I appreciate Governor Smith coming back to the legislature and recommending another tax bill after his first tax proposal was defeated by the largest majority any tax proposal has ever been defeated by. Uh, I feel it's much more practical than the plan he presented before. I think it's more realistic. I think it's keeping us within the pay as you go. Uh, I feel like it has a, a chance, maybe with some amendments, of passing the House. I don't uh, tend to predict the Senate, but I've heard that they're not going to pass anything over there without a corporate income tax. I think it's totally unrealistic. Totally. You don't like any part of it? No part of it, whatever. It's 100% on consumer and no tax on business, whatever. It's a repudiation of the Democratic platform of 1970 that promised a balanced tax program. And to me, it represents one step backward for Preston Smith and one giant leap backward for mankind. After the second major proposal by Governor Smith, it's now back to the drawing board for the Texas legislature. And again, it looks just as it did in the beginning of this session. It's going to be a long, hard struggle before anything is ever finally concluded here in Austin as far as the budget is concerned. In fact, there may be, again, several special sessions of the legislature. This is Roger McDonald, Channel 8 News on the Move in Austin. I think we're behaving quite responsibly in the matter. It takes a lot of time to make a decision like this. They have to consider many factors. What about his condition when he arrived at the hospital that evening following the wreck? He had severe lacerations in the forehead and uh, suffered a head injury, or what we call a concussion, was uh, quite or not oriented as to time and place. He had lost considerable considerable amount of blood. Was he drunk or had he been drinking? No, sir. He was not drunk. He had not been drinking. It is medically impossible for a man to be intoxicated and not smell alcohol in his bed. I worked over his face very closely for approximately an hour and a half. There was absolutely no uh, odor of alcohol whatsoever. There was nothing in his behavior to indicate intoxication. There were seven other employees here at the hospital who worked with him, and they testified also that they found no indication of alcoholism. But wouldn't you be able to influence their statements, being the boss? I'm not that stupid. Jerry, I don't feel comfortable at all. <laughs> Of course, you're being chased by quite a few good teams, aren't you? Well, we are. There are three teams right behind us, only one game behind, and there's still five games left in conference play. And so all we can do is just look forward to the next game, and that game happens to be Rice here at 2.30 Saturday, and uh, we've got to get ready for them, and we must beat them. The good thing about your schedule is that you don't have but a couple of games on the road, and the teams that are chasing you have to play each other so they could very well knock themselves out of the picture. Do you look at it that way? Well, I, Jerry, I guess I've looked at it every way that it could be looked at. Uh, yeah, we have three out of our last five games at home, and I feel like this is an advantage. Uh, some of them don't have that good a schedule. Still, it all boils down to we have to continue to win, and we've got to hope they knock each other off. But... Um, the big ones here Saturday, Rice University. Rice beat you down at Houston. Will that add some impetus to your trying to win this one? 
Well, I think it's, it's there whether I dwelled on it or not. They broke our six-game winning streak, and they beat us pretty bad in Houston. And uh, my kids remember that, and naturally this is going to be extra incentive when uh, we throw the ball up Saturday. Do you have any members, I know you're awfully proud of Goo and Simpson, any members on your squad that have surprised you and played uh, a better ball than you thought they might be capable of playing? Well, Jerry, you know, that's real hard to say because every one of these kids, the five starters I have out there this year, they had never played together before in their life. Three of them are junior college kids, and to be honest, I did not know how good they were. Uh, one of the kids, the kid that started with me last year, Ricky Hall, and Ricky's always done more than you think he can do. He's just one of those kids like Eddie Stanky was in baseball. Um, and then James Williams is a sophomore from Dallas South Oak Cliff and we call him Snake over here, and Snake has made tremendous strides, and right now I consider him a, a real good guard. And I think uh, what the American taxpayer really is entitled to know is that nothing is more wasteful than this hot and cold blowing in these kind of costly programs. We would be a lot better off if we had a an average funding level, maybe not quite as high as the Apollo mm -hmm. peak was, but maybe something like $5 billion a year, and would really retain this funding level uh, for a number of years so that we can plan in orderly fashion and don't have to uh, build up something here and then turn mm -hmm. around and uh, tear in the sand castle mm -hmm. with our own behind, which is what we are continuously doing in this. Now there's a draft deferment, but I would hope that uh, this kind of volunteer service to your community and to your world is equivalent and even more patriotic, say, than entering the military. Can you project a date when that might come to pass? I wish I could. We've proposed it. Maybe Congress will uh, pick it up this year, maybe next. I think it probably has something to do with the degree to which the war in Vietnam is wound down and the shooting stopped. Um, and uh, we go back to a peacetime military. Under those circumstances, I think we'd have a great chance of getting that proposition through.
Well, the president wants to widen the opportunities for an American to serve his country, either in the Peace Corps or domestically, full-time or in the summertime or part-time in his own community. And so taking the existing federal agencies, such as the Teacher Corps, VISTA, and the Peace Corps, putting them together into one agency, we will have one place where a man can write and volunteer his service. Then once he enters service, if he's overseas and he comes back home, he can continue because the same agency can put him to work back here fighting the same problems back at home. And then if he goes on with his career, maybe he can continue to contribute his summers or part-time. And this is, this is being worked out right now. And I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think you'll see a new burst of energy because the American people, I think, right now are tired of a lot of the negativism and cynicism that they've been hearing. Mrs. Alley, was your house one of those hits? Yes, it was. Have you seen it? Yes, we did. We just went, we didn't see it too well. We went over there just now to look at it, but we couldn't get up to it for all the pieces of flame that were over there. Is it pretty well damaged? Uh, it's turned over on its side. I couldn't tell if it was torn up or not. Where's your husband right now? He's look, going to see if he can get some baby milk. <laughs> we, all of our baby bottles and everything were in there. Do you know whether you'll be able to move back into your house when all this is cleared away? Does it look like it's damaged too badly for you to move in? I don't think we'll want to move back out here. <laughs> Why? Because of the tornado. Well, we heard so much about tornadoes hitting trailer houses anyway, and then it hit ours. I don't want to live out here anymore. <laughs> Do you think you've lost very much of your personal uh, belongings out here? I don't have any idea. It's dark out there. I can't tell. Is it insured if you have? Uh, we don't have it insured. I don't know if they have insurance here at the park or not. Where are you going to spend the night tonight? I think we'll go my sister's at Wiley. Uh, I don't think that'll have a, an effect at all on our bond program. In other words, the unsettling condition in the police department will have no effect? Not at all. None at all. Who's going to pay for these $20 million in bonds? Uh, all the taxpayers. Uh, this will increase our tax rate to where a $20,000 home will uh, cost us about uh, 90 cents a month more in taxes than uh, that is six years from now than we're paying now. Mr. Cooper, quite frankly, what are the chances for the nine parts of this $20 million bond issue? I frankly think they'll all pass, and most of them overwhelmingly. One of the most controversial is also one of the smallest, the $450,000 for the uh, landfill area to share with University Park. Well, we, we've got to have that. We've certainly got to bury our garbage. Uh, what's your recourse if it fails, as many people say it will? I feel like that uh, we'll have to take it out of our uh, general operating funds. There's no other way.
the flower power that they have is largely of missile type. And this is the fastest flower power they have. And make no mistake about it, they have very good missiles indeed. Some of the NATO navies are outranged by these missiles. Nevertheless, providing that you have air power, and I think it should be, uh, and not I think, but we have naval air power, that outranges and outguns the Soviet missile power. Now, perhaps the more difficult uh, gentleman to deal with is the subsurface ship, in other words, the submarine. And make no, again, mistake about it, the Soviet submarine force is extremely big. And in the briefing that we shall be giving um, later on today and tomorrow at this uh, conference that we're going to, we shall quote figures of, I think it's 380 submarines. Now, I wouldn't want to say that they were all in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization area. Of course, some of the Soviet submarines are uh, disposed out in the Pacific and would be used there in time of emergency. But the force that we have to face in the Atlantic is certainly very big indeed. Tired of it. And they want an outlet. They want a place where they as people can work with other people and helping them on a personal human way to achieve a better life. And hopefully this agency will spark that kind of new American idealism. The OEO proposes that the industry take it upon itself to conduct experiments to determine what is going to be the best program that can do the best job of freeing up some of these communications channels between the poor and the non-poor. By programs, you're not just talking about uh, cable originated programming, but of total involvement, aren't you? We certainly shoot for total involvement, but as you know, cable systems operators are going to be originating programming very soon. And one of the best ways, we think, to make the program uh, maximally effective is to involve the persons about whom the program is programming is going to be created. For example, if we're talking about local origination, then it seems to me it would be a good idea to locally originate in some poor and disadvantaged communities, as well as some non-poor communities. And to get the involvement of the people who live in these communities is our concern.